I think we can get started. Welcome and thanks for joining today's session, uh, starting your career in the defense industry at Northrop Grumman, resume tips and tricks and understanding security clearances. We hope that you are enjoying our Credential Month events. I'm Tasha Washington, Senior Associate of Student Engagement here at Greater Washington Partnerships Capital Collab. I work with students in the Digital Tech Credential Program, and the Digital Tech Credential Program helps students gain and demand skills that they need to get the most out of their studies, and it's designed for all students in all majors in partnership with Capital Region Universities. I will go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. Um, joining us today from Northrop Grumman is Sherelle Wright. She is our talent acquisition partner at Northrop Grumman. She's been with Northrop Grumman for four years and joining the company through a new graduate professional development program. She's a graduate of Virginia Commonwealth University and holds a bachelor's in psychology and also holds a master's in organizational management from George Washington University. We also have Thomas Testata. Thomas has been with Northrop Grumman for over nine years and is currently serving as a security operations manager for Northrop Grumman, overseeing the El Segundo California campus. In addition, Mr. Tosato manages a team of security professionals assigned to a multitude of classified programs, primarily located in Redondo Beach, California. He is thoroughly involved in the hiring process for many security applicants in the Southern California area and has recruited at various West Coast campuses including UCLA, Cal Poly Ponemo, and USC. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you, Tasha. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sherelle Wright. I'm on the corporate university recruiting team here at Northrop Grumman. Um, and we'll have a uh, very interesting and fun session for you today. So um, hopefully you enjoy it. Please feel free to ask questions throughout um, the the presentation and we'll go into the the chat box and kind of answer those after i'm done presenting um just to give you a little bit of background about northrop grumman we are a global aerospace and defense technology company um, our largest customers being our branches of the military and our nation's allies our company right now has over 90,000 employees so a huge company um, and yeah, we're just excited to connect with you. Um, our university recruiting team in particular is responsible for connecting with um, students like you and um, engaging you so that we can share employment opportunities with Northrop Grumman. So I will um, put in the chat box a link so you can complete a profile with Northrop Grumman to show that you were here at the session today. And um, so don't log out before you get that, that link from me, but I'll put that in the chat. Um, so yeah, we can get started. Um, our first things up, um, we'll be talking about resume building, of course, and then we'll, we'll go over taking a professional photo, interviewing, and then we'll have some of that Q&A, and then I'm going to pass it over to Thomas to talk about security clearances. Okay, so resume building. So why all the fuss about resumes? Um, your resume is your commercial ad. It's a job hunting tool, um, basically uh, to get you the interviews that you want. Um, it provides you an opportunity to showcase your strengths and um, a direct way um, to get the employer's attention by showing specific accomplishments and experiences that you've had. Um, basically the impact of a resume, like I said, it's the first impression. It doesn't guarantee you a job, but um, also if it's done incorrectly, it can prohibit you from getting uh, the job that you want. So um, who reviews your resume? It'll be recruiters like myself and also hiring managers whose team you'll be working on directly. Okay, so the main purpose of a resume to get an interview. All right, and interviews help secure jobs. So what do employers like Northrop Grumman look for? So we're looking for um, your main um, accomplishments, that you're a, think a thinker, critical thinker, problem solver, that you're a leader, you have leadership um, capabilities and also confidence. We look for cultural fit as well as value add to our teams. And then also um, your communication skills, that's written and oral communication skills, as well as any technical skills that you may have. 
All right, so we like to highlight the three C's when you're creating your resume. So that is um, clear, concise, and consistent. You wanna make sure that your language is very clear, it's clean, it's simple, it's straight to the point. Um, you want to be concise, you wanna identify your knowledge, skills, and abilities, like I said, straight to the point, and then be consistent with an easy to read format. Um, you wanna stick to like Times New Roman or Arial, um, no smaller font than like than 10, 10 point um, font and then keep the page borders at one inch as well. So you just wanna make sure it's concise. You don't wanna do anything too fancy or out of the box, um, very um, clear and concise. You can use bold, bold typeface or um, underlining capitalization to highlight um, different important things on your resume, but just stick, staying away from those like fancy, like cursive fonts and things like that. Okay, so resume organization, we'll go a little bit into the, this um, a little deeper in the next slides, but basically you're gonna have your contact information at the top, an objective if you choose to have one, um, an education, um, list your education because that's what's most relevant to you guys right now. Um, you will then go into your experience and skills, any awards you have and recognitions, and then any leadership organizations that you're a part of. Okay, so contact information, I'm sorry. Um, basically, you, you just wanna include your name, your, your preferred name and um, the name that you go by and your address. You can include both your school and permanent address to let the employer know exactly where um, you're living currently and then where you're looking to um, move back to after school. Um, don't forget your city, state, and zip code as well. Make sure you have your phone number, your primary contact number. And that's important because we'll reach out to you via the phone number that you provide. Also, you want an email address that's a professional email address. Usually your first and your last name would be included in this. And um, make sure to avoid any like inappropriate words or any like um, email addresses like cupcake15 or anything like that that's not related to um, you as an individual. So um, that's kind of the outline at the, the beginning of, um, of the, the resume. Okay, and also if you have a professional website, you can use this as well. Um, I've seen portfolios and things like that. You can, you can definitely include that. All right, so using an objective, there's both pros and cons to using an objective. And it's basically up to the job, like the job that you're applying for. So I've seen people include them and not include them. So I'll just go through some of the uh, pros and cons. So it clarifies exactly what you're looking for and um, what you have to offer. You usually see something like three years of experience and I'm looking for um, you know, a technical position, I'm a STEM major, things like that. Um, it can be tailored to fit any job that you're applying to. So it can be edited per job, um, but the cons, it, it also can close doors. If you get too specific, um, and, you, and you don't want to like limit yourself from the positions you're considered for. So make sure that you include, you know, what you have to offer and how many years of experience and like what you're generally looking for. Okay, so make sure it's clear and it meets your career needs overall. All right, so using an objective uh, again, so be, be clear, be concise, be specific about what you're looking for. Summarize um, your professional goals and um, um, just just make sure you're concise. So a good example and of an objective we have at the bottom of the screen to obtain a full time engineering position involving RF microwave uh, design testing. So that's clear, concise, says you know what what the candidate is looking for and so on. Okay, so for education, you would like to. Um, include your education next. I know you've heard different things about where education should go within your resume, but it should be included at the 
um, top of the page for you all because it's most relevant right now since you're in school. So you wanna include your most recent education first and then work backwards from there. You don't have to include your, your high school or anything like that. You can just include your, your college or you know, bachelor's degrees, master's or PhD. Uh, you wanna list your school, your degree, um, and your major, and you definitely want to put your GPA on, on your resume if it's 3.0 and above. Um, so that, that's some of it, the indicators that we look for, 3.0 and above for um, on your resume in particular. So um, like I said, list your expected graduation date as well, um, being that we wanna know whether you're going, going to qualify for an internship or an entry level position. So um, that's also nice to have on there. Okay, so experience and skills. You want to list your um, your employer, um, most your employers that are most recent, and then you can work backwards. But basically, um, list any internships you have, any other related work experience to the job you're applying for. You want to list and make sure you have the employer, the location, the dates you worked with with that company, and then your responsibilities. You um, can also list. Um, closer towards the education section. Um, you can list any classes or projects that you've worked on that might be related to the job. I've seen that. If you don't have any work experience, we definitely consider your classes, coursework, any projects you have. Um, also, you want to list if you have a security clearance, um, active or um, inactive and things like that. Make sure you put that on your resume. Um, use action and power words when you're trying to uh, describe your responsibilities. You don't want to use any like passive uh, language, um, but basically you want to use those action and power words to start out the sentences of your responsibilities. You also want to emphasize any leadership roles that you currently hold or you've held previously, even if it's in clubs, in sports, anything like that. Um, you want to list computer skills and languages and, and all of those things you want to include as well. Okay, so experience um, continued. I would just um, make sure to highlight on this page the PAR statements. And you want to highlight a problem, actions, and results. That's kind of a good uh, layout of how to explain your responsibility um, in your particular um, experience. So um, you can state a situation or task that you had, the specific actions that you took, and then the end results of that. That's a bit, very good indicator for us to see your experience. So for example, um, redesigned service processes, increasing responsiveness 50% and reducing queues 50%. So putting those quantifiable measures into there, um, into those statements really allows us to see what exactly you were a part of, what, what your role was, and, um, and things like that. So definitely include uh, those quantifiable actions. Okay, so leadership and organizations. As I talked before, um, I'm sorry, I think I have like a timer on this uh, slideshow, but basically leadership organizations, we have um, many engineering organizations that we personally work with at campuses. I know there's like SWE, SHIP, NSBE. If you're a part of any of these organizations or societies, you wanna include this on your um, resume as well. We definitely look to see if you have this experience, basically because it's another indicator that you are part of the, an, a leadership organization, you're getting leadership skills, but you're also learning those STEM and tech, technical skills and um, embracing those opportunities. We also like to see you know, community service, any tutoring or mentoring you might be a part of, clubs, um, organizations, like I said, and intramural sports. The more well-rounded, the better. Um, we, we just look for very well-rounded individuals. Okay. So bringing it all together, we have some um, examples of how you should kind of structure your resume being that, you know, the appearance and design, you make sure that 
you put the most relevant information at the top. So making sure that you have that education towards the top, um, clearly labeled sections um, as well. You want to make sure there's spelling, there's no spelling errors, no grammar errors or punctuation errors. So make sure that you are definitely double or triple checking that. Um, vocabulary, avoid using like different slang. You don't want to use LOL or anything of that nature on your resume. Keep it simple. Um, make sure to spell out your acronyms when you can and then avoid any repetition. You want to avoid using I or referring to yourself as I did this. You know, you basically would want to say achieved so-and-so or achieved um, a group project or something like that. Don't use I um, you don't have to refer to yourself in third, third person like Mrs. Jones or anything like that. But you want to make sure you're using an active voice. So here are some of those common action verbs and you all can use this as an example of what to put on your resume. But these are some pretty good action verbs to kind of show what responsibilities you have in your current groups, um, organizations and things like that. Okay. So make sure you are requesting a resume critique from um, your resources that are around you. You can go to career services, you know, faculty, um, internship supervisors, friends, even families. Make sure you're getting those critiques because I know even with my own resume, I might miss something like a small punctuation or grammar error, or they even might have suggestions on how something could be worded in a better way. But the more people that look at it, the better, um, just because you wanna get it in um, that tip top shape before um, the employers are, are reviewing your resume. Okay, so here I just wanted to show some examples. I'm sorry, my computer is not allowing me to do this. <laughs> I wanted to show some examples, but um, I'm unfortunately not allowed to do that. But basically, we will have this PowerPoint available for you where you can see a specific example of what a good resume looks like. You can kind of use that as your outline and we'll kind of um, have that there for you. And I just have a couple more slides on um, professional photos and professional development as far as interviews go. And then I'll answer all of your questions. I see there's a lot of uh, questions coming across in the chat. So I'll go back. Okay, so how to take a professional photo at home. So you wanna make sure with your um, portrait, you wanna make sure that it's just a plain, you know, white background. Um, we usually for our employees have like our photos taken at a NG designated studio. But um, if you don't have a studio that you can go to, you just make sure that you have like a plain white background and professional wear and, th and that'll work great and make sure it's clear, it's not fuzzy, you're not like driving in your car or anything like that. Um, this is kind of an example of what those photos look like. Okay, and some more um, tips on interviewing. So for interview preparation, you wanna review the job description of the job you're going into your interview for. Make sure you read it thoroughly, know what the job entails, make sure you know and research the company and make sure because you you know you may be asked questions of why you want to be a part of a company and it's especially for um, north of grumman we typically like to hear why you want to join the, the company and what you've heard about the company so make sure you do your research also make sure you know your own resume so you can talk to it we definitely look for candidates who are able to specifically talk to their resume and um just give us more details in that deep dive and, and so that they can show their knowledge, skills, and abilities. Um, I would suggest practicing mock interviews with friends or family. Um, definitely, if you can practice with any other mentors or anybody else, do that as well. But mock interviews are the best way to prepare for an interview. That way you already have that muscle memory essentially to say, okay, I've, I've done this before. I know what to say. I know what to expect and things like that. 
make sure you're dressing the part. You look groomed and manicured and polished. So you wanna make sure that you have your professional wear on, even though we're in the age of Zoom, you might not be going in for interviews right now into the office, but make sure you dress just exactly like you were going into the office. Um, if you are going into the office, bring multiple copies because you never know, you know, you might want one for yourself to look off of, or there might be multiple interviewers in the room. So you want to um, make sure you look at that. And then also speak clearly and loudly. Make sure you try not to mumble or, you know, others can't hear you. Um, just make sure you're speaking confidently. Make sure, you know, nonverbal speak a lot about yourself even without you talking so make sure you're you're confident you're sitting up straight you're smiling you're being enthusiastic and passionate about the job that you've applied for and show that you actually want it show that you've done the preparation and the work um, and also um, you don't have to lead the interview yourself um, you don't have to, you know, like ramble on and say, okay, well, I, I've done this and that and just keep talking, but make sure you are specifically um, clear and concise in your answers and just make sure you're just listening, um, doing active listening and then, um, yeah, making, making it a conversation. You don't have to feel the pressure to like lead the conversation. Um, yeah, so those are, those are some high level tips and, and that we usually give for Northrop Grumman interviews in particular. Like I said, other companies may take different routes, but, but this is uh, pretty much our advice and standpoint. Also wanted to highlight the STAR method. You, um, hopefully this is not the first time you've heard it. If it is, this is perfectly fine. I'm glad to be presenting this to you. But basically the STAR method is very, um, very helpful when organizing your answer to interview questions. So you're gonna go through a situation, a task, um, action and results. And I'll dive a little bit deeper into that, but basically that's how you can formulate your answer to a specific question. Okay. So actually, no, I'm gonna mention some more about the STAR. So I wanna say you come up with a situation that's happened personally to you um, related to the job that you're applying for. Um, something from a recent job experience or a, a classroom experience or a group experience. You say what your task was and what you had to do and um, you know, basically explain what happened. And then um, you go into the results. How was something fixed? How was something improved? How was something changed? Those are your results. And um, make sure, like we said in the resume, include those quantifiable measures as well. So like we said, improve the company's uh, ROI by 50% or something like that. You wanna make sure you're including what your specific task was and then what what you've done. I know we typically talk about, you know, as a team, I, I was a part of the team that did this, but we're mostly interested in what was the role that you specifically played. Okay. And so um, more interview tips uh, continued. You want to leave a strong impression when finishing an interview. So make sure you have questions ready and prepared. I know at the end of our interviews, we ask, do you have any questions? And we really like to see um, that you have some questions for us. Um, so basically you can ask about the company performance or a company structure. You can ask about day-to-day -day responsibilities. You can ask about, um, anything about your own resumes, um, a timeline, maybe when we'll get back to you or different feedback from your interview. You wanna make sure you're thanking the interviewer and you send the interviewer and, or the recruiter a thank you note after your interview. And then you can even connect with the interviewers on LinkedIn after receiving your interview feedback. So those are just some things you would do um, post interview that could also um, help to to forge you towards that position. All right, so I guess it's time for questions. I am going to stop sharing so I can see your answers in the chat and I'll start um, going down the line. Okay, let's see. 
We have um, a question from Sally, I believe. Does the boxes on the resume prevent the resume reading software from reading keywords? So I'll speak to, um, speak to Northrop Grumman in particular. So no, um, but also for Northrop Grumman, um, entry level and internship, we're typically um, not using that keywords function. Just This is just particular to Northrop Grumman, but um, basically, no, uh, just that does not prevent that. Does anyone else have any other questions? I think that's the only question that I saw, but- um, Sure, we actually, we actually have a few here. Um, do you want me to read them out to you? Yes, please, that would be great. Perfect. Absolutely. Okay, the first question I see is, where would you suggest placing security clearance on a resume? Good question. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I would do that near near the top um, after your, um, let's see, so it's your contact information at the top, you have your objective. I would say somewhere either below your objective or right after your education, it has to be somewhere near the top. So you can do it between education and experience or right above education. Perfect. And then what we can also do, Sherelle, is kick it over um, to Thomas, and then we can address the questions that come in, um, because I'm sure that um, students will have questions after Thomas speaks as well. Okay, great. So I'm also, Tasha, I'm going to put the Northrop Grumman profile link in the chat right now. Perfect. So everyone can, um, can uh, leave us their information. So I will reshare my screen, and then... We'll kick it over to Thomas. Go back up. Sorry about this. Okay, Thomas, I'm passing Perfect. Off. Thank you, thank you, Sherelle. and thank you everyone for uh, being on the call this morning. So I'm going to go through the uh, security clearances and what you should know. Again, my name is uh, Tom Tostado and uh, I'm working on behalf of uh, Northrop Grumman as a security operations manager. So if you can get to the next slide. Absolutely. So the agenda today is uh, kind of describing the importance of a security clearance, who's eligible, who's not, the various types of clearances, the process, because the process is uh, lengthy, and then some of the benefits and what can you do now while you're in school to help build your brand and things like that, specifically on uh, social media. But before we start getting into the slides, I'm going to have uh, Sherelle show a video that Northrop Grumman had put together. So if you can show that. Absolutely. Give me one second. has never been done before and we're able to this from the beginning. We're doing something that has never been done before and we're able to work with the smartest folks in the industry and at the same time we can't talk about it. I never planned to be in this line of work. I remember Northrop Grumman came to my campus. It just captivated me so much and I had to find out more. Folks that work on my program and other programs that are similar have the opportunity to work on problems that are changing the future of our country and really the future of our, our world. Being able to say that you come in and do that is so powerful to me and that's something that really gets you out of bed every day. So I've worked here both uh, before I had kids and now that I do have kids and it's definitely a different environment being in a restricted program with the kids. I have a pager. I had to give my daughter's teacher a pager number. It's my sole access to the outside world. I do have to give that out so that I can be accessed at any time. I can't always tell people some of the cool stuff I work on. I don't get to share my accomplishments, but I think overall there's that feeling of personal satisfaction because I know what I did. 
with someone asks me what I do or the industry that I work for, I normally feel pretty okay with telling them I work in the defense industry if they continue asking questions that I can't really go further than that. Muay Thai kickboxing, it obviously helps decompress at the end of the day, especially when you have a really rough day and you can't necessarily tell individuals why. You can physically get rid of that stress. No, I don't feel isolated from the mass, from the public. As a matter of fact, I feel more connected to them because I know that what I do or the products that I work on is ultimately helping keep America safe. When you first get it, I think that there's this kind of sense of awe, but I don't think it was anything I expected because you know you see like these James Bond movies and, and a lot of different things out of Hollywood and you think that it's gonna be something really crazy, but it's not. I do this work because I like the people. I like developing talent, I like managing people, I like you know seeing people succeed. Contrary to what people think, it's not some big scary thing to have a clearance. It's a pretty normal job and I'm very happy to be a part of it. I think there's always a cool factor associated with classified programs. It's a very close-knit family. They had taken part in something that will make a difference. I have family members in the military. My dad was in the Air Force. For me, that's what makes the sacrifice of working in a restricted environment worth it when I know what contributions that I made to the products that are coming out. You know, you know that you're doing something for the good of the country. You, you know that the work that you're doing is going to save lives and it's going to protect lives. That, for me, is the most rewarding part. When you're looking for a place to work, what you're really looking for is quality of life. And I don't think there's anywhere that offers a better quality of life than Northern California. And I don't think there's... Okay. Sharing back. Okay, we should be good to go. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. So again, uh, as you can see in the video, uh, classified information obviously is a sensitive information or material that can cause damage to our national security if it were released. So the, um, the factor of having a security clearance and the importance of maintaining that in clearance is important for uh, Northrop Grumman. So if you can uh, go to the next slide, we can talk about what is a security clearance. All right, so again, it's a determination by the federal government and it allows an individual to have access to the government's secrets. And a lot of times, uh, you know, if you come from a military family, if you're in the greater Washington area, you have a lot of federal agencies around you uh, there's three basic components of a security clearance, and you can see there on the screen, it's confidential, secret, and top secret. And there's some cases, too, where people will have a SCI clearance, which is uh, the sensitive compartmented information, or a SAP uh, clearance as well, which is an actual add-on of a special access program that the U.S. government is doing, and they may do a, an enhanced uh, screening to ensure that the individual that is about to see the classified information uh, is certainly eligible to do that. And then who's eligible? We have some uh, folks down there at the bottom. All right, so we can go to the next chart, Sherelle. A lot of jobs do require a security clearance nowadays. Certainly all the uh, federal jobs, uh, FBI, uh, CIA, all the military branches, again, being in that greater Washington area federal jobs, a lot of federal jobs uh, do require it. 
Uh, and then the contractor positions, uh, jobs here at Northrop Grumman, some of the other contractors, our competitors, Lockheed, Boeing, Raytheon, all of those contractor positions as well. If you're supporting a government contract that has components of classified information, then yes, a security clearance would be required for the, uh, for the folks or the individuals working on that particular um, program. Again, it's just to ensure that when the government says you're about to see some of these uh, secrets or classified information that the individual that's about to hear, see, read, or what have you, or be involved in meetings uh, has been vetted appropriately and can see the uh, classified information. So Sharaf, you can go to the uh, next slide, please. So obtaining is, uh, it is, it is a lengthy process if you look over on the right. Um, certainly we do have folks here at Northrop Grumman that come from the military background. And as that question was asked before, where should you put it in? That's spot on of what Sherelle was saying is I would definitely put it at the top because that is an added uh, bonus or feature that uh, an individual has been vetted. They've gone through that lengthy process that says something about the candidate and uh, it is an important part that should be added to the uh, resume. But if individual is coming straight out of college, uh, Northrop Grumman does uh, hire folks without the clearances obviously as well. And uh, if a particular program that they're assigned to requires them to get a clearance, then they would go through this uh, process that you see on the left. And right now it's taken a little bit over a year from beginning to end. And that's why it says over there on the right, just uh, certainly be patient as the security clearance is being uh, processed and worked and things like that. So we'll kind of go through some of the, uh, the history and the background of what they'll be looking at. If you can go to the uh, next slide. So see, these are some of the uh, topic areas that an investigator, um, a representative of the uh, US government, it could be a US government employee who does the background investigation. And it certainly could be a contractor that does a background investigation on behalf of the US government when they're sitting uh, in front of you. And they'll ask you to fill out this lengthy doc document. It's an SF-86, talks about where you've lived in the past you know, 10 years or so, or at least since 18, education, family, your employment, some of your travel. And also what it'll look at is the uh, employment records, the um, police records, obviously drug use, financial history, civil court actions, credit checks, and uh, things like that. I have noticed that with uh, college students on that bullet number one with residential history, there's a lot of different uh, residences, which is fine. Um, I just noticed that uh, with these various dorm rooms or going from apartment to apartment from year to year, uh, and even semester to semester, uh, there is some residential history that's um, kind of gets lengthy uh, in their uh, in their college careers. But certainly, the U.S. government is aware of that. Uh, not a strike against the individual, uh, but do try and keep some of those records because I know it's hard when you're in your junior or senior year and you're trying to recall uh, what you were, where you were living, you know, a year or two before that and trying to get those addresses back. So just something to think about. And as we go towards the end of the slides, we'll have some other tips that might help you as you prepare for um, a security clearance interview. If you can go to the next slide. So during the interviews, uh, they go through, like I said, that document where you're listing out all of these items, you're answering all of these questions and the investigator is sitting in front of you. And that's what that last bullet says, a subject interview. Uh, they're going through these topic areas with you. They also interview your friends, your references, your coworkers, because that SF-86 document will ask you to include your employer, your supervisor, your dorm room members, your roommates, uh, your college friends, um, coworkers, if you have a part-time job. A lot of times uh, you'll have to list maybe a educational reference such as a, um, an instructor, and certainly they'll uh, interview neighbors and things like that. So it's a whole person concept. Again, just trying to interview as many people as they can to uh, vet the person appropriately before that classified information is uh, shown to the, uh, to the individual who has a clearance. 
There's also other ways to vet as well. So not only do they do the background investigation on bullet one and they do the subject interview, but if you can flip to the next slide, um, some clearances, not all, but some clearances also require a uh, polygraph test as well. And at the bottom there, you can see there's various types of polygraph exams. There's one of which is uh, counterintelligence, making sure the individual's you know, not a spy, terrorist, saboteur, that kind of thing. And then there's also a, a lifestyle test asking about what we had talked about earlier, uh, drug use and criminal activity, court actions, things like that. And then uh, sometimes you'll hear the word full scope and the word full scope polygraph test is just a combination of both the counterintelligence and the lifestyle questions being posed to the applicant or to the candidate uh, trying to acquire the uh, security clearance on behalf of the US government. So if you can flip to the uh, next slide. Once all this data is collected, so they have the results from the background investigation, they have the results from your interview, they have the results from all the neighbors, the credit checks, they have the results of the polygraph, it goes to uh, what we call this adjudicated process. And the adjudicator looks at, you know, is what it says up there, the personal and professional character of the individual. Again, to ensure that the overall assessment of the person is that they're an honest, trustworthy person and that uh, they have they've used sound, good judgment, as you can see there on that last bullet. So again, we wanna make sure that the individual is reliable, it's got good discretion and uh, is making good choices as they're in school. If you can go to the next slide. When they do look at uh, events that do happen, because we're all human, people do make mistakes. What they look at is what's the nature, the extent, the circumstances surrounding the, uh, the contact. And then they look at the individual's age, as you can see there on bullet number four and maturity, it says at the time of the uh, conduct. So let's say something did go awry, it was a mistake. Um, again, that's not the end all process, but the adjudicator uh, makes a decision on the individual and they look at some of these things to consider when that item or whatever was done took place. So I do want you to understand that because people are human, no one's perfect, people do make mistakes. You do the best you can. The bottom line is when you're filling out that documentation or when you're with the investigator, just to be honest, trustworthy, because they, they'd rather have someone who says, hey, these are the things that happened versus interviewing a bunch of friends and hearing all the friends and neighbors say things that were never disclosed uh, up front. So again, the adjudicated process, very uh, complex, challenging process, but I wanted you to see this slide. As it says, there's, uh, there's some considerations that they look at in terms of uh, the overall conduct, uh, conduct of the individual. You can go to the next slide because there are some benefits once you're all done with this process, right? It's a, a good skill set to have in terms of being able to post that on your security clearance. Uh, another good benefit from having a security clearance is it allows the individual when they're at the contracting facility, such as Northrop Grumman as one example, uh, to work on various projects and programs and the individual can be moved around. Let's say, for example, we have an engineer who's cleared, has gone through that rigorous process that you have seen, and uh, there may be other opportunities when uh, programs start up or change or move where that individual can apply and get moved to different programs. It's also a good sense of pride in protecting the nation, the warfighter and things like that as we go. So again, it is a lengthy process, uh, not a difficult one, just lengthy because a lot of paperwork, but there are many, many benefits uh, to the clearance. And that's why uh, Northrop Grumman wanted to show you this one slide. So if you can go to the uh, next one. So what's most important is the choices you make today as the slide says, can determine your employment opportunities in the future. And um, again, it's based on federal law, not state law. And as we talked about before, some of those red flag areas about employment, police record, financial responsibility, misuse of uh, IT. So decisions today that you make are important 
as you're going through your uh, college career um, in terms of being around your friends and, and things like that. So we just wanted to, to make you aware of that. Be mindful of that. You have your whole career future ahead of you. And uh, the time to start planning uh, is basically uh, now. And that's what this slide is intended for in terms of decisions, decisions, decisions. And there's some actions you can take now to get you ready for the security clearance. And that'll be on the next slide if you can move to that one. So you can certainly go to the internet, download a copy of the SF-86. It's not classified. It's just a large document. It's got a bunch of questions in there. You can certainly peruse them take a look at them and know what kind of questions would be asked in the future. If this is something that you choose to do in terms of obtaining a security clearance. That residential history we had talked about earlier, again, sometimes very difficult to remember what took place two, three, four years ago at various apartments, various dorm rooms, uh, various locations you may have lived. So as the slide says, creating a record of residential history is important. Start identifying some folks or people that you can use as a uh, character reference. And you're gonna have uh, people that can uh, speak on your behalf as a, a good character reference. You would only know who would be uh, best at that point in terms of character reference. Continue to make this good decisions. And then the credit score. You know, on the college campuses, they, they, um, a lot of times they'll have these applications for uh, these, these credit cards and things like that. So. Just be mindful of that. Uh, the credit is also looked at and reviewed. And uh, again, it's just another example, another sign, another point in an individual's life that uh, US government can, can look to to say, yes, this person is credit worthy. They've made good decisions. Not the end all, but again, just one other data point uh, that can be used. And then maintaining a positive uh, online brand, and we'll look at that on the next slide. You do have a digital footprint on the next slide. On, uh, and again, it should be considered during the background investigation. So just remember what you post out there on social media, all of those kinds of things. Uh, try and clean it up, keep it clean. It says on there on that third bullet, delete or remove, it, remove inappropriate content and re request others remove negative content as well. So again, it starts now. I'm glad we are uh, trying to catch folks and brief folks uh, early on in their college careers. But again, people do make mistakes. It is what it is and uh, do your best just to uh, be upfront with it, but don't let that sway you from undergoing the, uh, the process. And with that, Appreciate your time. Thank you for uh, for joining our call today, and I'll open it back up to uh, Sherelle and the moderators for any uh, questions. Thanks. Thanks to you both. Um, we had a good bit of questions coming in, so I was just sifting through those right now. Um, what I will do is I'll sift through these a bit more, but Sherelle, I think there was a few questions for, for you about resume writing. Um, the first question I see is, what steps can someone take who's just starting on their path to digital technology to do to get themselves more involved and stand out more? Great question. Yeah, I would definitely say um, as far as joining the, the clubs we talked about, like um, different student organizations, that definitely just shows us that you are dedicated to doing something outside of your schoolwork. Um, so definitely get involved in those um, clubs and organizations as well as just um, when you're doing class projects and things like that, don't be afraid to volunteer for um, some leadership positions or um, within those, those class projects or meeting with mentors. We, we like to see that as well. So those are some things that could kind of uh, make you stand out um, amongst a pool of candidates. Great answer, thanks, Cheryl. And the next question, oh yes, just an example of how you would create um, the sentence structure for a resume without using I. Yeah, so I actually have an example. Perfect. So without using I, you could say, coordinated and implemented the restructuring 
of the QRC internal network. So you kind of just drop that I at the beginning or another example could be performed acceptance test procedures. Or another example, researched vendors and analyzed microwave devices for integration. So those are a, a couple examples. You just kind of drop that I at the beginning. Perfect. And then that was a two part question. And um, they also asked, could they do bullet points as well? Absolutely. Uh, love the bullet points. We always look, you know, that makes it more simple for us to read as recruiters. So um, definitely do the bullet points. Perfect. And this question, um, would you recommend using your professional photo on your resume? So we actually uh, don't uh, typically see that. We don't provide that as a recommendation um, either, either way. That's not one of the main um, important important parts of your resume. You just got to emphasize your, your education, your skills, knowledge, and ability. So I don't think the professional photo is a, a very important part to including on your resume. Thanks, Cheryl. All right. Given that industry experience and hard skills are predominantly valued in prospective employees, how important are soft skills in the technical workspaces at Northrop Grumman? Yeah, I would say a hundred percent. Like we are, um, I know we have some, you know, technical languages and different things that you can also uh, bring to the table, but we're definitely looking at those soft skills, those transferable skills um, at all times. So like we were um, talking about er earlier, some of those leadership, communications, um, things like that, we're, we're definitely looking into as far as, even if you're in the technical space. So we're, we're looking at that. Um, well. Perfect. And we've got some questions about micro, a few questions actually about micro credentialing. Um, and they want to know the two questions, do they distinguish individuals for a competitive um, applicant pool? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, sure. Yeah. So do micro credentialings uh, distinguish individuals from the competitive applicant pool? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I, that's 100%. Um, it definitely sets you apart. It gives you a uniqueness and it, it shows that you're getting, you know, an extra set of skills on top of your, um, your uh, regular uh, classes and coursework, but you're, you're definitely getting skills towards, um, towards gaining those credentials. So um, definitely does set, set you apart and, and we definitely look for that. So absolutely. Perfect. And I have a few questions. Um, thank you, Cheryl. I think that was all the questions on resume tips and tricks. Um, have a few questions um, towards uh, Thomas as well. So would you recommend that we continue to apply to jobs while waiting for a security clearance to be approved? Good question. Yes, a a absolutely. Absolutely. Continue your uh, applications in process. And a lot of times uh, employers like Northrop Grumman will even hire the individual without having the security clearance. There's multiple jobs that we, we have that don't require the security clearance to, um, to be onboarded. And uh, again, Northrop Grumman is willing to wait in, uh, in a lot of instances for the individual to uh, undergo that process while being employed at the company. So yes. Great question. I learned something new today. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is what happens if you make a mistake when reporting residential history? Um, example, two months off or similar. Not a problem. Uh, people make mistakes. Uh, I've been on the other side, so I've seen that happen. And um, again, people are human. So you see it. It's, it's not a I got you moment. It's basically during the personnel interview, during the subject interview, when you start to have that contact with your background investigator. Uh, the investigator sometimes may point it out to you. Hey, I've noticed that when I looked at the leasing agreement, the rental agreement, it said uh, you left in May and, and you told me it was June or April. Simply uh, state to the individual that it was a mistake. Uh, or, you know, I did leave early and uh, I ended up paying for that last month, but I went back to live at home with my mom and dad. Not a problem. Uh, that happens a lot. And uh, it's not malicious. It's not nefarious. And it is what it is, as the uh, person wrote in there. It's simply a mistake and they understand that. That's right. Perfect. Um, are dual citizens eligible for security clearances? 
Yeah, dual citizens is, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Is dual citizen, yes, the question, yes. the answer is yes. Yes, because one portion of that, ci that citizenship is U.S. So it could be U.S. Israeli, U.S. Turkey, U.S. whatever, but yes, they are. Perfect. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, and the last question I see here is how long does the entire security process take? Uh, when I was showing on that one slide, it takes about a year. It, it does fluctuate. I've had some uh, folks that have recently been hired into my organization where it's taken less than a year. I think the year is what was uh, placed on that slide through some of the metrics that Northrop has received from the U.S. government. But it could certainly be less. I don't anticipate anything longer than that, but um, the year is probably the average that we tell most folks at this point. Good to know. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I know we get that question quite a lot here with a few of our students, so that's really good to hear. Um, one more question came in. Um, what if you leave a residence and move back to another one? Do you have to add that address again? Yes. And the reason being is, let's say, for example, uh, you're going to uh, George Mason or what have you, James Madison, you, you, you're living at home. So you list your residence at home, you go to your dorm. So you list that, so you go back home, then you list your home again. So what it's looking at is you do have to list it in a chronological order. And if that residence appears five times, so be it. But what they're trying to do is connect the dots from, let's just say age 18 for all intents and purposes to present. They're trying to connect the gap for the last four years where the individual lived. So in that example, yes, I've seen residents listed multiple times because they go to school, come back, they go to school, come back, they go to school, come back, and it's supposed to be listed in the uh, chronological order. So that's perfectly acceptable, and it is seen uh, quite a bit. It's not unusual or abnormal in any way. Got it. Um, and there's two more questions that came in. I think that that covered the conversation. Those questions sparked a few more. Um, what are they looking for in a top security clearance? Well, it, it goes back to uh, honesty, trustworthiness, uh, basically uh, as best we can, because again, as I described, we're all human who make mistakes, but uh, clean credit, so clean financial history, um, drug, drug history clean, police record clean, so on those top security clearances, they're really looking for folks um, that have made good choices. And again, it's a hard thing to do, right? But have made good choices all the way from, you know, when they graduated from high school onward to the time of the uh, application. But even if you have, I'm gonna go back to this point though, even if you have made mistakes, please list it. It's a lot better to be up front and say, look, I made a mistake. I was a freshman in college. I know better. I am now a senior. I do want a job. I'm about to graduate. As long as the individual is up front, those are things that, um, that can be worked and can be taken into account in the adjudicated process when it's said on that slide of other considerations related to maturity slide talked about age and things like that. So bottom line is don't hide it, but um, top security clearances, yes, it, uh, the background overall is relatively clean. Great. And our last question here, I do wanna be mindful um, of our time as well. Um, and feel free also students, if you have questions, um, we can send them over to myself. Um, I dropped the email uh, there in the chat. Um, certainly feel free to reach out if you have any questions about the collab or our presentation today. Um, the last question that we have for today is how often does security clearance need to be updated and when or if it needs to be updated, do you start the process again from scratch? So it, it's usually about every uh, six years. Uh, and again, the cycle changes depending on the question related to the top security clearances and things like that. But that's kind of on average uh, as they go throughout. And what they do is on the update, they'll go out probably at least six months in advance. Let's say Northrop Grumman has the employee. The employee uh, last did their background investigation six years ago. Well, before it, you know, the six year mark comes, just as an example, again, it could be a shorter time frame depending on the level, but using that as an example, 
Northrop would reach out to their employer prior employee prior to that to say, hey, this cycle is about to occur again. Please fill out the documentation. We're not going to let it lapse. The individual fills it out. Northrop acquires that, looks it over, does a check on it, and then sends it to the customer, the U.S. government in this case. And that's when the um, background investigation ensues. And they usually just go from the time of the last time that you were investigated. So for example, if the person last finished their background investigation as a, let's just say a senior in high school, and they've been working at Northrop for whatever, five years or you know whatever the, the, the number is depending on that clearance. So let's just say five years or so or six years, they would go back just to the senior in high school timeframe at that point uh, and then work their way up um, you know, is, is the whole life always open for, for a look at? Absolutely. But that's generally, <laughs> generally of how they, um, of how it's done. Well, perfect. I think that was our last question um, of the day. I want to thank you both um, for doing this session. I know I certainly learned a lot. I hope our students did as well. Um, and also want to say, students, that we will be having more, more events like this um, throughout the month. Our next event is April 21st. Um, it's a candid chat on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Um, certainly don't want to miss that. Continue to watch your emails for updates and visit the Capital Collab uh, website as well to learn more. Thanks, everyone. Hope you have a great day. Thanks. And everyone, please fill out your Northrop Grumman profile. Yes. <laughs> please. I'm sure I'll actually share that again with the students. Just copy and paste so it's at the top there for their, their chat. Okay, great. There we go. Awesome. Excellent. Thanks everyone for attending. Have a good day.